just as they did back in 1897 when Queen Victoria celebrated her Diamond Jubilee. The historian Kate Williams has the story. In Queen Victoria's journal of 23rd of September 1896, she wrote, Today is the day on which I have reigned longer by a day than any English sovereign. There was great debate, even about a name for the event. The Home Secretary, Sir Arthur Biggs, suggested the Queen's commemoration, the Queen's year, or even jubilissimi. Perhaps unsurprisingly, it was simply called the Diamond Jubilee. The 22nd of June 1897 was declared a special national holiday and four million people squeezed into London to see their Queen. A quarter of a million pounds was spent on decorations. Wooden viewing stands were erected in Whitehall by the National Gallery, next to Charing Cross Station and alongside St Martin's in the Fields. St James Street was arguably the most beautifully decorated. Forty Venetian masks stood on either side, with evergreens strung from pillar to post. The Queen restricted the official jamboree to a six-mile procession through the heart of London and a brief Thanksgiving service on the steps of St Paul's. She travelled in her state landau, driven by eight cream-coloured horses and wore black silk. She held a white parasol above her head to protect her delicate skin from the warm summer sun. 17 carriages carried guests and 50,000 troops representing the breadth and colour of the entire empire processed to St Paul's Cathedral. The Queen was 78 years old and suffering from rheumatism. It meant that she was unable to climb the steps of St Paul's and she turned down plans to carry her up. So the service took place here as she sat in the royal carriage. On the steps stood the Bishop of London, the Prime Minister, Lord Salisbury, Mr Balfour, 500 choristers and two bands. Thousands more massed beside and between the pillars of St Paul's. In 1897, the power of Britain was at its height. Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee was probably the greatest celebration of modern times. But the girl who came to the throne so young and now ruled an empire would rarely be seen in public again. I could watch that a hundred times, Simon. <laughs> Kate is with us as well. I love the last 30 seconds, Incredible. especially those Incredible. images of Queen Victoria. So looking so happy and smiling Just and so full of excitement that this was her and her imperial pageant. It's marvellous. Um, there, there is a still it. photo, Hugh, yeah. of her actually with a broad smile. Yeah. We're, we're accustomed to our Queen wonderfully bestowing these lovely smiles on us. But when Queen Victoria did, it was like kind of an earthquake. Victoria <laughs> yeah. And she talked about the children. A lot, a lot of the George V, but Queen Victoria especially, talked about the children receiving oranges. And there was something about the old lady and the children that, you know, melted everybody's heart mm. after that I'm, long reign. I'm bound to say, because people will be watching at home and they will simply drop the contrast with today. Because today is on a very big scale. We're seeing the crowds gathering mm. right now. But when you look at those images, you compare today and it looks sublime and look at them out there looking magnificent mm. all the way up to Admiralty Arch, 50,000 troops in that procession Incredible. in 1897, mm. 17 Incredible. carriages, mm. umpteen bands on a much bigger scale than today. And no email to sort it all out. So how they all did it, it was, I mean, four million people flooded into London. They were everywhere. There were panics. There wouldn't be enough food, that there wouldn't be enough waiters. And it really was a great imperial pageant because, of course, at that point, Britain ruled a quarter of the world's population. Yes, that, Things are very different that's now. The point. Was, that's, all that, the imperial yeah. troops were in her train. That is the key. I think, actually, there was a great naval review at Spithead mm. instead of our rhythm moment. The, the, the Queen was obviously too old mm. uh, and the Prince of Wales went to sea. But then you know, the point of that naval review was to frighten the Germans, essentially, and everybody frighten else. Everyone. And we had so a great display of military muscle. What is so beautiful about the contrast now is that our strength is in our shared affection. It's essentially the glory of our monarchy, in a way, is in its lack of power. It makes the distinction between authority based on affection mm. and military hardware. Mm. We don't have the latter, mm. but we have, you know, a world 
beating delivery of instinctive affection for the Queen and vice let, versa. Let's hold on to the thought. Let's hold on to that thought because I want to take us forward to 1935. Yeah. Let's have a look at this because this is the Silver Jubilee of George V. And we have mm. Princess Elizabeth and the young Princess Margaret being lifted up there ah. onto, the, onto the balcony course, uh, by the king. Wonderful. People said she was deaf and dumb and that was his way of, of redressing that because they hadn't seen her. So they were showing the princess mm. and they showed, and everyone said, oh, look at the baby princesses. Mm. They're, they're having such fun, they're having this marvellous time. Mm. Balcony, bal whole, the whole balcony thing was, was really a 20th century suggestion and there, the king could hardly believe it. He said, I'm just such an ordinary sort of chap. Why are they all cheering me? He was thrilled. Uh, the George yes. V message as yes. well at the time he of that Jubilee jo was George significant. Yes, both, both Queen Victoria and George V wrote in private diaries and George V said, I had no idea so many people loved Aww. me. He used the L word. Mm. He was so gruff and mm. bluff and scary. The message, he was the person who invented the radio broadcast and it had a beautiful, rich baritone voice. And you, all, everybody out there, you can find it on YouTube. He said, I, I want the, my jubilee year to be dedicated to helping people to find work. I grieve for all those who have no work mm -hmm. and those who are disabled, meaning the veterans from the First World War. It was quite a different George V from the scary, sailor, ferocious disciplinarian. It was someone whose heart was out on show for the exactly. whole country. Jubilees, I think we really see our monarchs at their softest, at their most cheerful, yeah. because they're so thrilled by all this amazing tribute to them. I mean, it's a it's such a contrast with, with Victoria. I mean, the idea that Jubilees at all were going to be celebrated were really a, it was Victorian. It wasn't since, I mean, George III had a very small one in 1810. The idea that the public would want to come out and celebrate their monarch was, was something that's Well, they certainly the are century. celebrating. They certainly are celebrating.